this is the regular meeting of the budget and finance committee it's monday august the third we have a quorum mr we saw mr smith and myself in our parks as a cheer we would like to do is go through the agenda and uh... get concurrence from uh... my colleagues who can uh... consent items uh... eight which would be basically uh... agreeing with the h c e d report uh... and uh... adopting the motion by uh... alacon and we saw we get agreement on that one on nine uh... approve the cao recommendations and uh... would like to add to that report is an explanation of what the increase in fees uh... point seven five percent versus the one point eight five percent as recommended in the uh... new language uh... and also an explanation of the necessity of having an additional hundred million dollar uh... mikola uh... letter of credit uh... available that's mentioned in the report the rationale for that so consent on nine on ten um, Approve the controller's re, uh, request to execute an amendment to their existing contract with Network Incorporated uh, through August of 2010. I'd also ask uh, attached to that report if we can get the controller to advise us as to what has been the productivity and the performance of this company since 2006. Uh, number 11. Uh, we have a refund or approve the uh, Office of Finance recommendation for a $73,000 refund plus interest. <clears throat> also would ask uh, the Office of the Finance to get with the uh, committee clerk to give them information regarding the date of completion of the audit, uh, the date before the complaint, the claims board, and, uh, and the interest rate. Uh, that we've accrued since knowing uh, that the audit was completed and also a rationale as to CH2 Hill's miscalculation and also like to just add an information note for the council that the uh, Office of Finance has been asked to reevaluate the current policy of paying interest when a uh, company makes a mistake uh, as it relates to uh, uh, their payments and also they have been asked to reevaluate the current reimbursement policy. And then uh, number 12, that we approve the uh, 72000 plus interest for reimbursement of uh, the uh, Office of uh, Finance's recommendation and also uh, the same comment that the, they've been asked to reevaluate the uh, interest rate and also the current policy of reimbursement and ask that they... Uh, Give us a breakdown on the date of the audit completion, date before claims board, and uh, pro progressing to this committee so that we're aware of how the uh, interest was accrued. And uh, number 13, that we approve, uh, we concur with the Energy Environmental Committee uh, and also approve this motion. Uh, and in addition to that, if we could get some clarity as to if those funds are moved to the Lopez Canyon uh, Community uh, Trust Fund, do they still allow these funds to be used for future uh, uses as to the Child Museum and its facility? Okay, we'll move those uh, items. Uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. Uh, we're gonna, we were going to move item 1 on consent, but we have a card, and so we asked Mr. Hunt to come up on a card for item 1. Good morning or good afternoon. Uh, my name is Michael Hunt. I'm the plaintiff in the United States versus uh, the city of Los Angeles. I, incur I would like to encourage you guys to go ahead and do the right thing. Um, the bill is currently $480,000 that you guys would take initiative and stop charging the tax people um, another $300,000 at $700 an hour for my attorney 
and that you guys settle out and mitigate, have a beer summit, just such as the president did with uh, his other advocates. But it's time to put this to rest. I'm calling for mitigation behind closed doors. I'm calling for a check for $480,000 to be in my attorney's office in a couple of weeks. We can sit down and discuss it, discuss this, and let's get it over with. Thank you. My name is Michael Hunt. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Uh, I uh, ask that we move this item as recommended by the city attorney that the judgment of uh, that we deposit $270,000 uh, as relates to this judgment in the uh, in the court while the appeal is going forward. Okay. Okay. So we move that item with those instructions. So. Uh, Mr. Luther, if we can go through the calendar and deal with item uh, four and then five, six, and seven together, and then go back to two and three, which are the longer items. Okay. Uh, item number four is a building and safety report relative to fee review findings and recommendations. Uh, this is a discussion item for today. If we could have building and safety, the CAO and the CLA to come up and also the city attorney. Thank you, council members. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to discuss the building and safety review and the finding adjustments uh, pursuant to the 2009-2010 budget resolution and as directed during the budget hearings, uh, the Department of Building and Safety in consultation with the Office of City Administrative Officer CAO prepared the peer review and findings which was submitted on June 22, 2009. The report revealed that 30% of the current LADBS fees were uh, established prior to 1996 had not been adjusted for more than 13 years. Number two, and most importantly, are not cost recovery. And number three, are significantly lower than the 23 other jurisdictions and entities that we have surveyed. But the most important part is that they were not cost recovery. Most of these 30% of the fees are related to plan review and inspection of electrical, plumbing, mechanical, elevator, pressure vessel, equipment, and uh, soil report. Uh, we generally call that the mechanical permits, as well as a few other miscellaneous things, uh, temporary surgical occupancy and non-compliance fees are all, were also among the fees which were not cost recovery. It should be noted that the other 70% of the building and safety fees were cost recovery and uh, we, did, we are not proposing to adjust those fees. So what is in front of you it deals only with 30% of the building and safety fees, primarily what we call the mechanical fee, permit fees, mechanical plan check and permit fees, not the building permit fees, not the building plan check fees. Based on these findings, the report uh, proposes fee adjustment based on the cost on these 30% of the fees. And uh, in conjunction with, it, uh, with this uh, report, we are recommending that every three years, as the code, new codes are adopted, uh, these fees be reevaluated. So we are not 13 years out of cycle as it has been now. On July 14, 2009, uh, Planning and Land Use Committee approved the LADBSS fee adjustment proposal and directed the CAO to submit an analysis of the department's report to the Budget and Finance Committee. For the past three weeks, CAO has been working very closely with Building and Safety and City Attorney's Office. And I want to thank uh, Tyler and uh, Mr. David Michelson and Mr. Rich and because they have spent and probably more time together in the last together, three weeks that they probably have spent with their children. Uh, and uh, their purpose has been to, uh, they have concluded, the, uh, they have made a determination on the methodology for adjusting the fees to be uh, justifiable or is being justifiable. And the CEO report, uh, there's a draft of it, but it's being worked through. Uh, this, it is generally uh, supportive, but it is running through the appropriate channels through the CAO and will be submitted soon and will be submitted by August, uh, prior to August 10th meeting to your committee. Uh, both uh, Mr. Ray Chan of Building and Safety and the uh, CAO uh, City Attorney are available to answer any questions you may have. You know, one of the things, it was our intent today is uh, not to go through the reports and the fees but really to ask uh, all of the parties at the table to give them direction uh, because of our concern that 
the more we delay the less access to these fees we have during the fiscal year and the budget basically is expecting a certain number of months of retain of recovery of the fees what we'd like to make sure is that the CAO and the CLA are on the same page as relates to the issue of the full cost recovery that the formula that's used by building and safety is appropriate that we are not charging fees beyond the amount of time necessary so that we're protecting that enterprise fund if there is a policy decision by this committee or the council to reduce those fees then we clearly want to establish that as a policy and we also want to make sure that when we identify similar or comparative analysis throughout the region that is clearly a defined as a comparative analysis but not driving the fee structure on full cost recovery we'd also like to make sure the city attorney is prepared on the 10th to have the ordinance that will go with this proposal so that we can have this in the council on the 11th for final review and approval and so we can get this done before the recess and so if we can give those directions to the CAO and the CLA the city attorney and the department that we work out all of those concerns and differences before next Monday this item is scheduled for tomorrow which will continue to next Tuesday contemplating this item will be before the committee and so we'd like to not have anything fall off or drop out and that there's full concurrence when we come to committee on next Monday and then not saying you know not saying that the council there may not be a tweak in the turn but at least we'll have the full ordinance and there may be a sense of a dollar amount or something like that but we should we'd like to be prepared to have it fully approved at council on the 11th and that would take us what 30 to 60 days before it becomes effective 30 days so we could get close to let me ask you what we projecting nine months on the budget revenue the revenue I don't have a nine month figure but for the non comp the Tyler Munhall with CAO 12 month was eight hundred and eighty thousand and for the enterprise fund it's about ten million so eight million if it passes a council member if as you outlined it passes on the 11th at the council we are hoping it will become effective on September 14th and we will have nine plus months nine and a half months of the benefit of the fees which is a considerable amount of benefit and both the department and the general fund desperately need that okay so with those instructions we'll continue this to next Monday with those dates and appreciate all of you being here thank you very much the next items items five six and seven on the agenda are related to the 2008-2009 special parking revenue fund and the issue of declaring a surplus we can have the CAO CLA the city attorney and LA DOT and mr. Parks we did release a report on this issue late this morning so we understand that the committee has not had a chance to review that report do we have a representative from LA DOT okay let me see if we can find somebody from let me get started this is another item that we'd like to give some clear instructions on so that when it comes back to council or this committee that we're clear as to the direction we're going in we'd like to ask the CAO and the CLA to create as we mentioned before a joint report on this issue I understand the CAO and the CLA or the CAO's produced a report this morning I don't believe there was a cosign by the CLA and so we need to reconcile what those differences are because we'd like a joint report on that 
I would also like in that report that the city attorney uh, provides uh, the committee and the council guidance as it relates to the um, the de defi definition of the uh, SPRF and also a clear understanding of the requirements for declaring surplus. Uh, also would like to ensure the city attorney has the new ordinance about the recovery of the loan money that's effective of this fiscal year uh, so that all of those items will be before us uh, at the next time this is scheduled for committee. Uh, like as to the report, what I would like to make sure that we do is produce a report with recommend rec recommendations that would uh, warrant an eight vote, a eight party vote as opposed to it. We're not any intentions of overriding the mayor's veto. So all three of those items on the agenda today, I'd recommend that we receive and file them and produce a, another report with new clarity and direction that will uh, stand on its own merit. And part of that direction should be that uh, come um, uh, third quarter of this current fiscal year that we propose that we will evaluate or at least consider a, um, let me get the right term. A reimbursement resolution is part of this, these recommendations uh, that uh, we not move forward at this time uh, to move the SPRS funds to the general fund, but we, op we allow the CAO and CLA during this fiscal year to continue looking for funds uh, for these projects that we uh, also move forward that the projects not be delayed, uh, but that those funds stay within special parking revenue fund and that uh, as those uh, uh, projects come forward that we're made aware of what the ultimate cost or the contracts that are being uh, let of, so we're fully aware of what the potential cost for those two projects uh, that we also um, And also we'd ask this, uh, the, in that report that the city attorney advises us as to uh, clarity as to the change in uh, subsection 7 of 5.117 dealing with the repayment of, reserve, uh, of the uh, SPRS, how that impacts the current uh, deal as it relates to using uh, SPRS funds with the payback versus MICLA funds. Uh, down the road so we understand the clarity and the cost. Uh, and then also we need the city attorney to provide to the CAO and CLA the, potent, the foreseeable challenges uh, as, a, as we declare surplus, whether we jeopardize these special funds uh, as they currently are articulated and, uh, and if we uh, continue to have a, a declared surplus, how it impacts the original intent of the special parking revenue fund. The, uh, um, the other issue for the CAO and the CLA that they come together and, and give us some clarity in this report as to the bond obligation debt and what's currently pledged for uh, Hollywood Highland and Mangrove as to uh, uh, bonding in this fund. Also what the long-term financial impact and cost of declaring a surplus of 36 million versus the 18 million with no Mikola financing undertaken. Uh, also the whole picture of the Mikola debt outlook as to how it impacts our debt and financial policies. Um, also the, these funds uh, uh, can also be used for parking meters and structural maintenance and operations uh, has been uh, thought through as giving uh, and working with DOT to divert funds uh, funding sources for some of the function positions that might meet the criteria of the SPRS versus the general fund. Uh, but these are also we need the controller uh, to give us some insight as to the current reserve fund, the condition of the reserve fund, and how it's impacted by transfers and other impacts since July 1st. And we need to also clarify 
to request uh, in the Parks and Garcetti motion that identify re, uh, re, re, not replacing but keeping funds for the uh, Lamert Park and for the Vine Street that they would not uh, they would remain in SBRS so that uh, current projects can move forward. And that we also used, uh, as stated in the uh, special park and revenue guidelines, that we uh, make a decision as to this pro these projects and this transfer uh, prior to the third quarter of this fiscal year as dictated by the fund. And so those are things that we'd like to get together and make sure that everyone is in concurrence and it's controller information, the uh, impacts as it relates to these items that these three motions today are individually dealt with as receive and file, but that we produce a separate and independent report and recommendation of not moving that special revenue fund, but also including in there the issue of the uh, uh, reimbursement resolution should we not find the funds between now and the third quarter. And we'll continue that. Let me ask on the sense of the time timeline uh, we had asked before as to what it would require. Is that certainly we can't get it done before the um, uh, recess? And so, how much? Uh, what would we require to get a report back on all the issues we asked for after the recess? And would that be the first or second meeting in September? I believe your first meeting in September is going to be the 14th. Right. I think we should be able to report back at that time. So we get a report back on September the 14th? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and uh, I think uh, Mr. Parks requested this, but I know your debt impact statement says that the use of MICLA would not cause the city's debt service payments to exceed 6% of general fund revenues. If we could see the whole picture of what, where we are um, and how much more uh, space we have before we reach the 6% uh, general fund revenues. Uh, and also we could have, along with the, this report back, if this action, if any of these actions move forward, would that impact the commitments made to a garage on Broadway? Any questions on those instructions? Okay. Thank you very much. And just for everybody's awareness, we will not, this will be our we have one more meeting before the recess, yes. and then we come back on September the 14th. Right. Okay. Thank you. So we'll go to the next item. Okay, the next item is a continuation from the last meeting. We have 13 departments left to report with an organizational overview summarizing departmental operations under the 2009-10 budget. Uh, item three are uh, department reports on proposed use of discretionary funds, and the only department that has not yet reported is the Office of Finance on their portion. Uh, Employee Relations Board has asked to go first. Okay. These, we'll uh, let you pick the, uh, yeah. the order. What's, what's the first one? Employee Relations Board. Employee Relations. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> good afternoon, members of the committee, and thank you for allowing us to go first. I'm Bob Ferguson, the, the board's executive director. As I know, uh, Council Member Parks is aware, we're the smallest department in the city by far. We have uh, five board members who employ three of us as employees, and as executive director, I've been taking voluntary furloughs significantly, and uh, my executive assistant, Vicki Herrera has been taking them involuntarily, although she is uh, unrepresented because of conflict of interest reasons. She's in a bargaining unit, well, she's in a classification, which is in a bargaining unit represented by Engineers and Architects Association. And accordingly, Vicki is uh, taking what, what is equivalent to one week off, uh, one day off every two weeks. And, uh, that's put some strain on her, uh, our mutual furloughs have put some strain on the department in so far as, uh, as you're probably aware, the nature of what we do is that when the city has the most financial problems, the board has its most work. And uh, 
so with the furlough things going on, the board's workload has increased, and uh, we're also still involved with uh, ongoing decertification elections of uh, SEIU on Engineers and Architects Association and the sort of litigation that's uh, relevant to that. So in a nutshell, that's where we are. Okay. Let me just say, uh, I think we realize you're the smallest department in the city, but one of the things we do need, because we're going to ask the CAO and CLA to put together a game plan for the city uh, in, in the near future, we do need you to report in some form to give them some awareness of the current status of your budget, the, uh, the, the liabilities that are involved, the deficits, uh, how you intend to make those up, so they'll have that ability to merge that into a larger report that will go before council. Sure. Okay. Move to the next item, next okay. department. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next uh, department is the city clerk, followed by uh, CDD, and then I can address the controller's budget. Good afternoon, honorable members of the committee. Jean Legme, city clerk's office, and with me is Glenn Robeson, chief of our administrative services section. Um, we come before you this afternoon with the departmental prognosis of what I would call cautious reassurance. Um, I credit this a great deal to the fact that we are a medium-sized department, which in some ways helps us and in others hurts us, but also the um, vigilance of executive staff that have been vigilant with every dollar that uh, have been entrusted to us. After we have gone through our funding situation, and done the checks and balances and the pluses and minuses, we have determined that we do have enough funds on the premise that the ERIP that was before all of us on Friday, if that ERIP were to have gone through, we would have had enough funds to pay out all clerk employees who would be retiring from our department, leaving an approximately $690,000 deficit However, we believe we would have been able to absorb that $690,000 deficit through salary savings from the ERIP retirements, attrition, holding most of our unfilled positions vacant, one-time off-budget funding, uh, therefore re resulting in a wash. Um, this would assume no further cuts to our department. I would mention, however, that uh, this is not to say our department won't be impacted. We are already significantly impacted. Um, about 58% of our department is engineers and architects. So we have uh, quite a few people in our different divisions who are on the mandatory furlough system. Our front counter and our taking of business from the public, we have reduced our hours from, I believe, 7 to 5 to 8 to 4.30 in uh, accommodation of, of furlough. We also are severely uh, feeling the pinch in our systems division, and since we must accrue all our systems efforts to safeguard the city election, municipal elections process, <coughs> excuse me, we are necessarily finding some uh, deficiencies in system support to admin services, uh, council and public services, etc. The big uh, if is our ability to backfill. If we are not able to backfill in vacancies that we have in council and public services, our ability to support the city council in their day-to-day -day business will be severely impacted um, because of the in inability to uh, fill vacancies among our legislative assistants. Similarly, in our administrative services division, which in a great measure um, does a lot of the paperwork and administrative services, payroll, et cetera, for, for the city council and the mayor, we would really need to look at being able to backfill some of those positions or services in those regard would be impacted also. Um, any further cuts to our creative services would um, be catastrophic because we are down to three workers now. Um, having reduced it from a total of eight, our chief calligrapher and admin assistant retired on Friday. Um, however, as I said, after you do all the checks and balances, we uh, estimate a shortfall of about $690,000 on the assumption that the ERIP that was before us 
does go through. If the ERIP does not go through, we will probably uh, end up with a, a, a standing deficit of about 100 k but we do believe that uh, we will make every effort and we believe we will probably be able to absorb that. And uh, my, my uh, Chief of Admin Services is here to answer any specific questions that you have. Let, let me ask uh, one thing is that <clears throat> one of the notes we have that you believe there'd be some savings in your BID trust fund and also the city owned property assessments. Are those internal funds that you can adjust yourself or do they have to come before council? For the transfer of them would require a council action. And the, the issue, uh, and I think it's you're in much like every other department that you're in a deficit. But one of the things that uh, the reason we're having these hearings is for the CAO and CLA to grasp from the as up to date of information we have, so that uh, they can prepare a game plan for the city. Uh, depending on at some point it will clarify whether the ERIP is there or not there, what furloughs are there or not there, what layoffs are there. And so uh, it's important that as you move forward that uh, certainly there will be the, uh, all those things put in place in some fashion. But on the other hand, uh, uh, we will uh, certainly be looking at managed hiring and things of that nature as the year goes forward. So all of these uh, will certainly be moving forward in an effort to reduce the 300 and some odd million dollar deficit within the city. So uh, if uh, whatever cooperation the CAO or CLA is asked from your department, we'd appreciate that information. Absolutely. Coming. We can move on that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Next department is Community Development Department. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, committee members. I'm Richard Benbow, General Manager of the Community Development Department. I have with me Mr. David Esparza, who is the Assistant General Manager for Administration and Finance. Uh, I believe our report is also on file with you. In response to the Mayor's letter to the Department heads dated June 3rd, CDD has prepared this report on the fiscal year 2009-10 Department Operational Plans. I will briefly summarize the key points. The Department is pleased to report that based on projected funding and salary requirements, CDD will pay 100 percent of its salary and related costs this fiscal year. Our funding sources and requirements for salaries general account 1010 are projected to be approximately $20.2 million. This amount includes $4 million in ARA, American Recovery and Reinvestment Act funds, that will be, will be reflected in our salary account as soon as this has been received. CDD is not implementing any staff reductions this year other than through attrition. However, both the Early Retirement Incentive Program and EAA furloughs will have an impact on CDD staffing and services. The Department is in the early stages of implementing the 26-day furlough program for EAA members only. The EAA union represents 74 percent of our staff uh, or over 200 employees. And the furlough delays will result in a decrease in the number of hours staff will be present at work and providing services to city residents. It is too early to determine the total impact this reduced schedule will have on CDD operations and services. However, early projections regarding staff time that will be affected suggest there will be an impact. Furlough delays will be, furlough days will be staggered at CDD offices throughout the city so that the offices will stay open for their regular business hours. As you may know, we're in the process of a reorganization under which we are opening up regional offices to better serve the communities throughout the city. However, coverage will be reduced on some days due to the furlough, and this will have an impact on operations. For example, 24 human services operations staff are represented by EAA and are subject to furlough. The operational impact of this reduction in work hours is delay in product delivery. For example, the review of family source proposals has been delayed by two days due to the furloughing of staff. 
As far as the impact on services that CDD provides, there will be a decreasing amount of time available to serve residents directly by staff. Again, another example. Thirteen of the 16 human services staff assigned to a family source center are represented by EAA and are subject to furlough. The cumulative impact of this is that staff will be working 2,704 fewer hours. That's 26 days times 8 hours times 13 staff during the fiscal year. Staff schedules, schedules have been adjusted to avoid a reduction in hours that the centers are open to the public. However, the overall reduction in hours will result in a reduction in interaction between staff and participants. If, for example, a staff member meets with an average of one participant per hour, we stand to lose 2,704 contacts. The department has 76 employees eligible to retire as of June 30th, 2008. If an early retirement program package were offered, CDD estimates that out of the 76 employees eligible to retire, 51 would retire if five additional years of service credit were offered as part of the ERIP. We have also conducted an analysis of which positions vacated through early retirement are considered essential to department operations. Of the 51 positions most likely to be vacated if ERIP is offered, 37 or 73 percent of the positions are considered essential or critical. Internal administration of grants is one of the areas anticipated to be greatly affected by potential retirements. The complexity, number, and size of the grants that the department administers require a great deal of expertise and training to effectively manage the reporting requirements, legislation, and regulations. More than a quarter of the fiscal management division, including the director, will be eligible for early retirement, potentially impacting the managing of the grants and reporting to the federal and state departments. With the addition of the ERA funds and the city's conversion to the new FMS system, operations will be further impacted by the loss of staff. It's estimated that CDD will experience a significant number of contracts for ERA programs, which will result in increasing demands on staff, processing payments to contractors, and fiscal reviews by auditors. And these two sections combined will have one-third of the staff eligible for early retirement. If employees take early retirement, it's anticipated that salary savings will result. It is requested that CDD be able to replace staff covering critical duties and positions or at a minimum using the city guidelines of one staff hired back for every three positions vacated. The 26-day furlough program will, will, will result in approximately $1.7 million in savings. As CDD has paid for its full share of related costs and as the grant funds that CDD administers are restricted as to types of use, we would recommend these savings be carried over for programs, services, and other one-time costs. Despite the early retirement incentive program and the furloughs, CDD will continue to administer the grants, including the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, in a responsible manner that protects the grants and the services they afford to city residents. The decrease in staffing, however, may impact the rollout of programs, the rollouts needing to occur sequentially rather than simultaneously as a result of having fewer staff to administer the grants. Priority will be given to programs that are the most time sensitive and have the biggest impact on residents, the city, and health and safety. Okay. Let me just ask on the issue of, uh, did you say that in your decentralization program that that will be impaired or stopped or is it you're going to move forward on it? The what? the decentralization program. No, we will move forward with the, okay. with the decentralization. All right. Then the other issue is, is it that... It will have some impact, though. Okay. It's, it's as, far as, down a bit. As, as far as what, establishing them, or as far as the services provided? As far as the services that are being uh, uh, rendered through the regional offices. Okay. Then the other issue is, is that uh, with the funds coming in from Aura, does that have any additional impact on the general fund? 
Yes, the uh, the additional funds will help us cover all of our related costs. Uh, over the last couple of uh, fiscal years, we have come before this committee and others indicating that we've had a shortfall in covering our related costs, which then have to be covered by the general fund. Mm -hmm. This year, we will fully cover all of our uh, related costs and salaries for uh, the department. Have you looked at your deployment with the concept of with and without ERIP? Yes. Okay. So, so you're prepared either way it goes? Either way. Okay. It, but ERIP will have an impact. Okay. There's something I would like to point out in that particular case is that over the last 18 months, we have talked about a staffing level for our department of 272 uh, individuals and indicating that through attrition that we would achieve that staffing level by June 30th, uh, 2010. Uh, I'd like to tell you today that we are at 272 uh, staff for our department, well ahead of that uh, June 30th uh, uh, deadline. The impact that this is going to have then is that since the model for which we are uh, built our operations is at 272, the uh, additional attrition or EREF, if it uh, takes effect, will have a significant impact on our uh, service delivery. Okay. Let me ask uh, one other question. Is that recently uh, we had the uh, block grant money came in, another, what, 19 million? CSBG? Yeah. Was it an R? They put an R? Yeah, CSBG R. Now, what's the status of that? Because we were told that the uh, there was a portion of it that we were going with a 25 percent human services, and we were trying to get an approval. And if that approval didn't for, was not forthcoming, then we drop back to 15 percent and then look at the next cluster of projects. Yes. Uh, and actually, what we did is we uh, resubmitted our application. It was uh, due on uh, July 28th, and uh, we, drew, we dropped the public services portion of that uh, submission to 15 percent. And one of the fortunate things for the City of Los Angeles is that we were able to move some of the projects that were under public services into a different classification, CBDO, which uh, is a community-based uh, uh, development organization. And so uh, we still have the same mix of uh, programs and services in that, but we were able to recategorize them into to others. When will that re prioritization come to the council. Uh, is that in, on its way, or how do you intend to address that? The the uh, the actual submission? The, the issue is you said you've reprioritized the projects. I think everybody was interested as to where, on the first cut, where the money was going. Yes. And I think it, would, it even went back because there were some concerns about projects overlooked. So now, if you're reprioritizing them, I think the real question is, what is the official list that the official list stands as it was originally submitted. They were just recategorized. There was one project that, that did fall off, and that was a uh, economic development project for Mavericks Flat. Uh, that project was because of concern raised by HUD. That was removed, and that and those the original six hundred thousand dollars that was allocated to that project was then redistributed through other uh, projects and services that were short of funds uh, in this, and particularly the concern that was raised. Uh, by the personnel department on the $500,000 that was needed to cover uh, fringe benefits for the sidewalk construction program. Uh, of that 600000 542000 was moved to that particular uh, line item in order to fully cover that uh, those costs. The, <clears throat> the remaining portion, I think about 68000 was uh, moved to cover the um, uh, States 1C uh, match for the housing project. So the money, you know, that was the only project that was uh, changed, and that money was redistributed to other projects that were already on the list and had mm -hmm. gone through the city council. Could you ensure that each council office gets the final list and with the changes on it so everybody's aware? Because I think initially there was discussions about what council districts and where the money was going, and then there was an adjustment, and everybody was kind of... Uh, waiting to see what the 15 percent versus 25 percent where that went because the, and with that reporting it's, it's the need to also reflect 
where the funding and what council districts so this fully aware of where it's going i'll make sure that your office has a copy every of that office. every office has a copy of that <clears throat> thank you very much and, and the issue is is that uh, as you worked through this as we've told each department you have to look at it from both angles as to the e-rip and without because it's going to be very important to assist uh, cao and cla as they complete their final report on what the city's game plan should be thank, thank you, you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Parks, the next department is controller. Uh, they did not have a representative that was available to speak on uh, today at committee, but they did submit a written organizational overview, and I can summarize very quickly for them. Um, this is a department that has 67 to 68 percent of its employees represented by EAA, so much of the staff is implement currently implementing furloughs. Uh, they would project at this exact moment that uh, they would have a deficit at year end should nothing change of three hundred and fifteen thousand dollars. Okay, and so you have that report now. Yes, we do. Okay, uh, if you could make sure that the committee members gets a copy of it and will basically uh, uh, allow that report to go forward as part of your assessment down the road for the uh, uh, final game plan. Yes, uh, the next three departments in order would be Convention Center, Cultural Affairs, and Department on Disability Convention Center. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Mary Jane Aquino of the Los Angeles Convention Center, and I am here to report on the fiscal year 2009-2010 Department Operational Plans. Pursuant to the CAO and this committee's request, the Convention Center has respectfully submitted its information and in alignment with the 2009-2010 budgetary deliberations before this budget and finance committee, the Convention Center will continue to be fully supported by revenues generated at the center. We will continue to manage our revenues and our direct expenditures within the context of financial solvency, and there will be no negative impact to the city's uh, general fund. At this time, the convention center does not anticipate any funding gap. However, if there should be any revenue or expenditure funding gap in the future, the convention center will achieve a financial or fiscal solvency through internal adjustments. Uh, the Convention Center has submitted its salary requirements and also it has submitted its organizational chart as was previously committed and that it will continue to work with the CAO and other agencies to ensure that our re unique requirements to meet our contractual obligations with the Sports and Entertainment District, the Staples and our um, show management and exhibitors will be fully met. Uh, for just a brief note on your plan, you, you're primarily relying on the furlough days. How does that impact the contractual agreements as to providing the service for the conventions and other things coming in? Yes, so uh, we have uh, started with furlough of uh, about 20 um, employees that are members of PAA and they have, or rather, they have been scheduled to take their furlough days. And we have taken steps to make sure that we mitigate um, those days that these employees are not available to meet the requirements and that we are still fully meeting the needs of our show management and exhibitor uh, requirements. So there, there is an impact in the sense that there are less people to service these exhibitor service orders, but we have scheduled them in such a way that we do have uh, staff for when we have to uh, enter those service orders that are the bulk of the, uh, that are the bulk of the, uh, rather the, the entries. 
to meet the uh, service order requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next department is cultural affairs. Good afternoon, Saul Romo for the Department of Cultural Affairs. We are a small department that is quickly becoming eligible to become a member of the endangered species list. The department is currently experiencing a salary surplus of about $467,000, due largely through the restoration of the shared responsibility and sacrifice funding. In addition, the department is generating salary savings through the mandatory furloughs. 67% of the department's employees are represented by the Engineers and Architects Association, so much, while much through the detriment of the individual employees, each furlough day is resulting in a salary surplus for the department. In addition, we are maintaining an 11% vacancy rate, which is also adding to our ability to maintain some salary surpluses. I can also report that the department is in the process of closing some grant programs for which we received funding in the past fiscal year. As we close the books on those programs, and we, brought, we are going to begin processing the reimbursements back into our salary accounts and contractual services accounts, which will add to some of our surpluses. And finally, we, I can report that the department has aggressively uh, pursued administrative reimbursements for our public art projects, which will also contribute to our salary and contractual services surpluses. Regarding the impact of the furloughs, the, we can distinct, separate our department into two separate operations, our field operations and our administrative operations. Our field operations consist largely of our, our theaters, our art centers, galleries and museums, and historic sites which we manage. Those field operations are on Monday furloughs. On a normal operating budget year, we have minimal activity at those centers on Mondays because we we generally are heavy on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays in our theaters and our art centers. We generally have light classes or no classes on Mondays. So making the transition from sending furloughs on Fridays to Mondays was a very easy transition for us to minimize uh, the impact on the program services. With regard to our administrative operations, our employees and our administrative offices continue to stay on the second and fourth Friday furloughs. That is now beginning to have a tremendous impact on our administrative operations. And I think I can make a generalization for all small departments and perhaps some mid-sized departments that with, with vacancies and with furloughs and having staff shortages, we, you feel that impact most poignantly and immediately in small departments. We don't have big staffs to which you can pass on the, the work or to mitigate the work by having some uh, consolidations in our operations. So we really do feel that impact right away. And at the moment, we're finding that we are even having trouble maintaining our regular day-to-day -day operations, such as in our accounting, uh, in our accounting offices. We, our accounting staff, in addition to having vacancies, with the additional furloughs, we're just having trouble meeting the day-to-day -day requirements for reporting as well as the day-to-day -day re requirements for making payments on time. Regarding the impact of the ERIP, 31% of the department is eligible to retire. 19% of the, those eligible to retire are eligible to retire under normal retirement or, and 12% are eligible to retire for early retirement. So this is certainly uh, an operational issue which we are going to monitor closely. It's difficult to make an assessment of how that will impact the department until we know exactly how many employees will be taking advantage of a retirement program. The final thing I think I'd like to close on is that uh, I've never, having worked in a few departments during my tenure with the city, I could say that I've never seen such a group of dedicated employees work so hard and do so much with so little. And so I had to have some unfreeze request through the man as a result of the managed hiring before of the managed hiring committee. Hopefully we will be seeing some favorable responses to those because as I said, specifically in our administrative operations, we're now at the point where we're having trouble just meeting the day-to-day -day deadlines. 
Okay. Let me just ask, uh, uh, it shows from your report that uh, you're going to start furloughing people on Mondays because many of the facilities are closed. But generally, for instance, our theaters, are, are, our facilities are closed on Mondays. They're dark, and it's the administrative catch-up day on our, uh, our museums and our galleries and in our art centers. So we don't normally run classes on those days, and we don't normally program on those days. So it's very easy to transition to a furlough on Mondays without impacting the, the program services. Before furloughs, what did they do when the facilities were closed? Well, that was the administrative catch-up date. That's mm -hmm. the way, because we do work. We do also do work on Saturdays and on Sundays. While we were while the facility, our staff was still staffing the operation on Monday, we were closed to the public on Monday, but we were still doing our day-to-day -day operations, the administrative timekeeping, the administrative contracting, reviewing all of the curriculum. Okay. We'll move that item. Thank you. Uh, the next department is Department on Disability. Good afternoon. I'm Regina Houston Swain, Executive Director of the Department on Disability. The updated operational plans that we uh, submitted address potential salary funding gaps for fiscal year 09-10. As directed, these projections utilize the most recent pay period of the current fiscal year, which does not include a recently vacated position, the ADA compliance officer. Um, our request to fill this position has been submitted to the Employee Relations Board. In summary, the operational plans include alternative scenarios implementing both the Early Retirement Incentive Program and the Furlough Program for EAA employees. Scenarios are included with and without ERIP since such plans affect the basic salary requirements. 13 of 19 existing positions are represented by EAA MOUs. Uh, therefore, there is a projected savings of approximately $129,000 arising from the implementation of the furlough program, uh, which results in a net surplus of $74,000. Four of six potential candidates for ERIP may possibly participate in the program. Two people have already said um, that they will not, uh, which would result in significant salary savings under all scenarios. The only scenario under which layoffs would be necessary would be the, in the unlikely event that there were no, no furloughs and that no one took advantage of the ERIP. That would result in a $55,000 deficit for the fiscal year in salaries account. And uh, the furloughs have already been implemented, and the office remains open every day. Uh, we've modified the staff schedules to make sure that there's coverage. And obviously, uh, there's impact to the public, but um, we're trying to mitigate um, the negative impact. And I think we're doing pretty good. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Let me. Uh, before we go to the next department, so we can get something clarified. On item four, where we dealt with the building and safety, is there an issue about the next week that we should be concerned about? Thank you, Mr. Mm -hmm. Just informing you uh, that the department and city attorney and CEO shares your strong desire of getting this done as soon as possible and have it uh, finalized before the recess. Mm -hmm. However, it appears we have looked at our calendars and looked at the council availability for a fee adjustment ordinance such as this, it requires one reading if there are 12 council members present and the vote is unanimous. We were aiming on, as we had discussed, to take it to the council on, uh, on July, I'm sorry, on August 11th, but it appears during that week we may not have 12 council members. So we are going to do our best, and our purpose is to inform you, we are going to do our best and we are going to go back and strategize find any which way that we can get it in front of the council, but there is no way that we can have two readings 
uh, before the recess, and it appears that we may not have 12 council members for any of the sessions before the recess. So I wanted to share with you that we share the desire of having it done as soon as possible, but it may be, much to my dismay, uh, have, have to wait for your uh, return from recess. Yeah. Well, I think the issue that we can start with is, that, is the information we're requesting is not available by tomorrow. And if I understand, it won't be available through this week. And I don't know what the number of council members yeah. Well, yeah. is. Ten, the, ten every day from here on. Yeah, council members Dave Michaels in the city attorney's office. It's my understanding that um, uh, next week, uh, through your final uh, council date, which is Friday, August 14th, you're going to only have 10. You will only have 10 council members present. So even if we um, worked with the clerk to get the ordinance published tomorrow, uh, you've got 10 days under state law before you can take it up. Which you could therefore take it up on the 14th, Friday. But with only 10 members, you'd still be required to have two readings. If you had 12, you could do it in one reading. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we're probably looking at is when you're back in session as early as, frankly, September 1st, Tuesday, uh, you'll probably get your fuller complement back uh, at council, and then you could take, um, take the measure up in one meeting, as long as you had 12 unanimous, uh, and then it would be adopted at that point. We'll still be back this coming Monday with the yeah. final product. But wouldn't it be committee. in our interest is that we get it before council on the 11th, and even though it's not 12 members, the second reading only requires well, the, the problem is you can't, you cannot get it uh, to council by the 11th because under state law you've got a 10-day um, publication requirement. So tomorrow's the 4th. If we publish tomorrow, difficult but feasible. If we publish tomorrow on the 4th, 10 days would run uh, for Friday the 14th. Um, I think we could do the Friday the 14th is the first reading. Correct. Okay. That's exactly right. But if you don't have 12 folks, you can't do it in one fell swoop. You're still looking at coming back on Tuesday, either the 1st of September, of, frankly. Yeah. But Which I think you could otherwise way, do on the first reading on the 12th, but you can have 12 members present. We, we had not, uh, the city attorney informed us about the, that state mandate of 10 days from the publication to the first vote of the council. And that has obviously created a challenge. Right. We went back and crunched some numbers and found out who's going to be present on the 14th, and um, that's why we're suggesting more realistic. You're looking at uh, Tuesday, September 1st is your first and probably your second shot if you can get the 12 votes. Well, well, my dilemma is that if we bring it in on the September and looking for 12 votes, all you need is to have somebody have a concern about these numbers, and we're off into the middle of September. True. So the earlier we get it before council, even though we don't have the 12 votes, it's in our interest that they see it, they can digest it, and between the first and second vote that they can bring up their concerns. Otherwise, we could be pushed off in to September and October by having a flurry of activity on one day. I agree We've just not Mr. been successful at getting complicated things done in one reading. Right, well, to play that out, if, uh, I hear what you're saying, of course, and to play that out, if it got its first reading on Tuesday, September 1st, and there was not sufficient votes to get 12 unanimous, it'd have to have a second reading on Tuesday the 8th. Mm -hmm. um, and as long as you have your majority on Tuesday the 8th, it would be done at that time. Yeah. The alternative is we could try to get this published tomorrow with the clerk. It's going to require a bit of a Herculean effort, but we'll certainly do, it our, be do our best with CIO, Building Safety, in our office. We get it published tomorrow. It could come you up for the first time on Friday the 14th. The ordinance. Pardon? You say when published, you're talking about the ordinance. That's correct, okay. sir. Yes. Right. And that way, you could get it on the council for Friday the 14th as for at least the first reading. So, if that's your preference, we can certainly do our best to try to get that I, done. I would think, for me, it would be that we try to do it the 14th on okay. the first reading, gives everybody exposure to it, and then you bring it back on the first for the second reading and get it moving. Excuse me, Council Member Tyler Munhall with the CAO. I hate to be the uh, wet blanket here. Then don't say anything. Then. I, <laughs> <laughs> he's, trying uh, to be pra he's trying to be practical, though. I think. I'm not. I realistically, uh, I think that you think you need more time. Our offices need more than okay. less than 24 hours uh, okay. to get this out. Well, if you need more time, we don't want to. Uh, bring it in half baked. So if you need more time, let us know, I, and then we can judge it from there. I, I think we need uh, more time to to get you exactly what you want, and therefore posting it tomorrow is unrealistic. Okay. And so you're also do you need the time to work out whatever the issues are between you and the CLA and all uh, that is those issues? 
There are some calculations that we have to do that we, we're, okay. we have basic agreement on a methodology, but it needs to get approved at, above me, and, um, and we need to, I need to coordinate with the department as well okay. on, on doing those. To summarize, Council Member, uh, we will do, it appears that the likely scenario is that if a final approval date would be early on after you return from the recess, but we will be back for uh, August 8 uh, for the round two, and on August 8 you can move it out of the committee. August 10th. August, August 10th. 10th. Sorry, okay. August 10th yes. We still make the August 10th date. Absolutely, yeah. for budget and finance. Yes. Okay, so tomorrow when it comes up, we move it to the f September 1st? Uh, you may want to move it to se August 14th. Uh, well, well, we should only do that if we're able to publish tomorrow. If not, it would be September 1st. And I appreciate the CAO trying to be clear-eyed about this, because I think all of us have enthusiasm to try to get this done, but we also want to be practical at the same time. Okay. So the thing that we, we would need by tomorrow is for us to be given a date of what we continue Correct. tomorrow. Correct. Okay, we'll definitely do that. But we will still have this scheduled for the 10th here in committee. Yes, for budget and finance, absolutely we'll go forward on the 10th. Yeah, we're all shaking our heads yes on that. All right. So if you tomorrow we need a date of what we can For city see. council, for first stop. That's correct. We will, we will provide you with the date after we return. All right. Council member, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, returning to uh, item two, the next three departments would be El Pueblo, Emergency Preparedness, and Environmental Affairs Department. El Pueblo is up first. Good afternoon, Chairman Robert Andrade, General Manager for El Pueblo. Uh, department submitted uh, its uh, response to the, um, actually a revision to our um, operational plan. I believe this is the third revision we've gone through, um, as well as my colleagues have done that as well. Uh, essentially, our, our findings are that um, with furloughs, uh, with EAA represented employee furlough savings, uh, the department anticipates approximately $11,000, $12,000 year-end deficit uh, that can be made up through uh, a number of uh, can be made up 11,000 should not uh, should not hurt us too much uh, however uh, should um, should the furlough savings not be applied uh, the EAA furlough savings not be applied we'd be looking at approximately seventy six thousand uh, dollars that's considerably more of a hit to us um, we have instituted the furlough program it is operating the only real constraint we have with it right now is uh, our EAA reps, uh, represented employees, 10 out of our 17 employees, uh, are all sort of in critical positions. Our accounting people collecting rents, our events people who generate revenue, about 300000 a year uh, through uh, events and, uh, and filming. Uh, that presents a bit of a problem for us. We're managing by uh, adjusting schedules uh, just recently. Uh, scheduled a furlough day or we had a big 18-hour production and so uh, uh, we're looking at how we can have production companies actually cover the cost of, uh, uh, of those furloughed employees so we're trying to be creative about that as well. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, emergency prepar preparedness. Good afternoon. Anna Burton, the Assistant General Manager for the Emergency Management Department. Um, our department did implement its furlough program. I'm um, starting the, the second period, pay period, with the first being on um, July 10th. Um, our anticipation um, with the furlough program is that year end we will have a $75,000 surplus. Some of the considerations that we did take is that um, with an entire staff of 27, the furlough program does impact 21 as required of all of our staff. That includes all five of our division chiefs, as well as all of our emergency preparedness coordinators and senior admin staff. Um, with the furlough program, we have instituted um, coverage of our department Monday through Friday to ensure that all public safety um, considerations are taken into effect, um, primarily with the move into our new emergency operations center, the support of police and fire in special events, and coordination of just ongoing things. We felt it critical that our public safety focus remain intact. So we do have minimal staffing on what are otherwise the city furlough Fridays. 
We do also have one person who is on long-term medical leave. Should this person return back through the year, this $75,000 surplus would be used to offset the return of that staff member. The primary impact that we've seen thus far is the change of some of our community outreach programs. With the limitation of staff hours and overtime, we have moved our fares from weekend days to weekdays, and then limited weekday outreach efforts in hopes that we will be able to get staff to volunteer to change their hours. We submitted our program and all of our reports, and given anything else, we should be fine through the end of the year. Let me just verify. You said you prepared for seven-day-a-week operation? Currently, we have staffing five days a week, but in an emergency situation, we would respond as necessary. Do you call in? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, the – anyone taking a furlough day, doesn't it affect the immediate need to go into an emergency situation for the city, does it? So, any of the people taking the furloughs does not affect our ability to get into an emergency situation for the city? No, sir. Our department is prepared to respond to the emergency operations center any day, 24-7. Okay. Thank you. Environmental Affairs Department. Good afternoon. I'm Dee Allen, the GM of Environmental Affairs Department, and with me is Beth Gines, who is the Assistant General Manager. You have our report, but I'd just like to summarize and highlight a few things with regard to environmental affairs and then leave the rest for questions if you have any. We are continuing to be committed to the greatest environmental and public health protection for the city given these difficult times, and so that has been our focus. EAD has 28 professional employees. Of the 28, 24 of them are on furloughs, and we have had about a 25 percent loss in our positions over the last four years. We have not had any clerical staff since the budget cuts of 08, 09, so we have learned to do a lot more with less over the last several years. One item I'd like you to be aware of, unlike other city departments for this fiscal year, we experienced a layoff in our department, a senior accountant, and she was off the payroll June 30, 2009. We have applied for over $5 million in grants each year, and that grant money has helped to offset the general fund and to fund environmental programs. EAD's budget is really less than $500,000 on the general fund. Most of our, 75 percent of our budget comes from reimbursable fees and special funds. Currently, we don't have a deficit. We have a surplus of $71,000, and that is because we have instituted the furloughs for our employees, all but four, 24 of them. We'd like to, and we're requesting that we, we're requesting a resolution authority to fill the senior accountant position using the savings that we had in addition to special funds and grant funds. That position was 50 percent off the general fund, and it is critically important that we fill that position because not having a senior accountant in a department that gets $5 million in grants can be very difficult in our ability to be able to do our work and get these grants fundings. The other item that we were going to use, program that we're going to use the senior accountant for, was our annual billing with our LEA fees. Currently, we do an annual billing, but we were proposing to go to a monthly billing so that the general fund could realize those savings early on, and it also could help the fee payers as they deal with these economic times. And so that's that person that's critically in terms of the accounting and the billing to be able to do that. So we've asked for a resolution authority to backfill that position that was laid off, and none of the funds to support that position would be general funded money. So we would appreciate your consideration on that. So coupled with the furloughs and the layoffs, we have about a 13.4 reduction in staffing this year. 
So some of the things I just highlight for you that 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 what that impact means is that there will be um, take us longer to do certain things. Um, we haven't decided what we're not going to do yet, but it will take longer. We've uh, staggered the furlough day so that we have coverage throughout the whole week and are able to do that. It may delay some activities on our climate change and our sustainability. As I mentioned before, it may it will delay the collection of the LA fees on a monthly basis that we all have agreed to. And um, it would probably affect the number of grants that we go after um, in terms of environmental initiatives because of the infrastructure to be able to support those. And, and especially in the stimulus grant, we did get a notice um, last week that we received $250,000 to do the energy strategy for the city. And so part of that position that we're asking for was going to be some of the funding was going to come out of that. And so we may be able to reduce that if we're not able to do it. The last thing that I wanted you to, to be aware of is that we have one uh, fee-funded division chief who is eligible for the early retirement in our LEA program. If he chooses to retire and we're not able to backfill it, then we could fall below our minimum staffing requirements for the LEA, the local enforcement agency, I'm sorry, and maybe temporary decertification. So that's a critical position that's delegated to the city um, from the state that we need to make sure that we can have that position. Let me ask you, your grants, are you, how do you go forward on either front-loading them or are they reimbursement grants or what type of grants are we normally dealing with? The grants that we're, we're looking for now, the stimulus grant, has an allocation for some staff funding in it, and so we work with them on the budget to mm -hmm. say it's not really upfront money, it's it's money that's eligible for it, and so we took a portion of, out of the $250,000 to be able to do that. I think most of our grants are not reimbursable. It's uh, a mix of reimbursable and, and upfront, and we have some arrangements, depending on the type of grant, with some of the other departments to provide some of the upfront money. The $250,000 grant is upfront. Upfront money. With your budget and the condition it's in, what, how do you propose that you're going to be dealing with the front loading or reimbursement grants that are forthcoming? We will utilize the ones that provide the upfront funding. We, what we're doing is, is just shifting staff to where the funding is available. We have luckily some very versatile people that are that can do a lot of different things and we'll just shift them to where the funding is, get that work done, and then look for reimbursements. Okay. It's going to ask why the CA, what are those the authority request was on, particularly on the LEA, which is a uh, the position she uh, D was referring to is a uh, ERIP position, right? That has not separated. Uh, the LEA position. Or are you talking about the, the accounting? LEA. The account, the accounting um, staff position was going to be used to have to go to a monthly billing, and that is the position that was late that I had to lay off. Um, and so we've asked for a resolution authority to fill it based on money that we have from special funds. Mm -hmm. We have the funding. In, in we have the, the funding to in the position, and it was eliminated. It was eliminated. If, if you would like to see it a report back on that one position, we can. Yeah. I, I think the, both those two positions, yeah. I think both are kind of critical. So, right. right. And we're not sure on the on the ERIP. It is a division chief, and I'm you know I'm not sure whether he will retire or not. I hope that he will. But not still, <laughs> but if he does, then then that's critically important that yeah. we backfill that. Because yeah. yeah, as part of your game plan report. Could we get the assessment on both of those positions? Uh, yes, the the ERIP position though we have, you know, it, it hasn't happened yet. You know, so, yeah, but, but uh, if, yeah, if it were to happen, I think we're going to have that kind of situation in in many many departments where we're going to have to determine which ones are backfilled and which ones are not. Okay. Um, but the other, the what is it, LEA? Senior accountant position. That one we can uh, we can report back on that position. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next three departments are Ethics Commission, Department of Finance, and Housing. Good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Dina Galley. I'm the Deputy Executive Director and the Director of Enforcement and Legal Affairs at the Ethics Commission, and with me is Heather Holt, our Director of Policy and Legislation. 
We're here on behalf of our executive director today. Um, Ms. Pelham was called out of town unexpectedly on a family emergency. I'm sure she would have liked to be here to answer your concerns about what is for us a very critical situation. Um, you have our report, but I'd just like to point out, I think the most pressing issue before us is that we have a projected $400,000 salary shortfall at this point. We anticipate we can make up some of that um, with the $250,000 uh, trust fund for the special prosecutor. Um, however, we do have some concerns about routinely using that fund, uh, which is uh, for that purpose of, of, of uh, hiring a special prosecutor if necessary um, for salary purposes. But we understand this is a special situation and a special year. So, Is that a re rotating fund that gets replenished each year? That's my understanding. Correct. Um, just like to point out that uh, of the uh, total staff, 63% are EAA members, and therefore those are the ones right now who are shouldering the, the furlough situation. Uh, that changed our expectation of 100%, and that has uh, fed into this shortfall. We also have one restored position um, that we anticipated originally to be a, a, a layoff. We're very happy to to have that restored, but that's also something that isn't, wasn't projected in our original numbers, that salary. And then we also have a structural issue with, with a projected, um, there's a projection in, in, in uh, all budgets that there's a certain percentage of attrition, 3% attrition, which is probably reasonable and uh, what happens in most departments, but just as it happened in this one over the, over the course of the last few years, we have not had that. So it's, it's a built-in expectation that didn't come about, and so our, our salary requirements are greater than our funding. Um, with respect to the early retirement program, we have just one position that uh, is at one, one uh, staff member, rather, that would be eligible for the program, and uh, it is somebody who is uh, so critical to our organization. She's, she's basically the glue that holds the entire operation together. She's responsible for administration, personnel, payroll, purchasing. She deals with auditors from the controller's office. Uh, she's basically the, the whole sort of uh, administrative platform. So she would not only be sorely missed should she decide to leave, but it's really difficult to imagine how uh, operationally we could continue without, without um, uh, backfilling that position, which I understand is, is something that, that is, will have to be considered for a number of agencies. But for us, because we're very small and thinly staffed, um, our, our positions are quite critical. Uh, in terms of the, the operational impact, uh, we estimate we're losing about 3,000 work hours of uh, staff who are all 100 percent dedicated to our core um, uh, mandates, analysts, auditors, investigators, um, trainers, peop the people who give advice and so forth. So without doubt, we do anticipate that there will be less product coming out of our agency, although or at least less at, at a lower rate. But we, we will make every effort to meet all expectations. We just don't believe we can do it at the same pace that we have been. And our, our mandate and our responsibilities, our areas of responsibilities, only continue to grow. I'm happy to answer any questions, and as is Ms. Holt, if, um, I'm sure, <laughs> if, uh, if you have anything. You, you go back over the concern you had about uh, uh, tapping into the special prosecutor. Have we used that fund in the recent past? We have used it for the last several years. Okay, so uh, and as it happens, we haven't had the, the need for it, uh, for its use as it's intended to be used. But uh, it was built into the charter. It's a, it's a, it's a charter provision. and. Um, it's it's uh, a program that's there so that uh, in the event that the city attorney uh, determines that uh, his office is unable to, to go forward with a, the prosecution of a case and so advises the board, the board can then uh, determine and vote for the use of that fund to pay for um, a, a private source for, for that when's, legal work. When's the last time we've used it? I believe we've never used it, so I guess okay. that's the good news. Okay. All right. So the, so the issue is, is that if that should come to pass, uh, uh, if you're talking about um, moving what all of the money is, 250 is all of the funds. Yeah, the, the, 
The amount is $250,000, and we're projecting just a little over a $400,000 shortfall. So we're still $150,000. So the issue is that if something happens this fiscal year, you just have to come and get that replenished if you had a need for a special investigator. I guess you would be seeing us here, yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. The $408,000 salary deficit, that's just for the fiscal year? How much do you run each year in a deficit for salaries on average? Well, there's a built-in 3%. And so last year I think it was about $140,000 that we were short, and we tapped into the special prosecutor's fund for that. It sounded to me like this is higher than normal. No, no, I'm happy to know. $408,000. So why the increase in the deficit for the salaries? Well, I think that approximately $120,000 is from this structural deficit and sort of its compounding nature, and an additional $60,000 or so from the position that we were restoring. Then the furloughs, which we anticipated to be spread among the entire body of employees, and also that would have included the more high-paid positions, is now reduced to be just on the back of that 63%, and the difference is we estimate is a couple of hundred thousand. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. The next department is finance, Department of Finance. Good afternoon. Antoinette Cristobal, Director of Finance. With me today is my Administrative Division Head, Joy Ory. The Office of Finance submitted its operational plan, taking into account the furloughs as well as the other impacts of the operations. What we have found is that we will be faced with a deficit of about $1.5 million, and what that equates to is about 33 positions within our operations. As you know, the Office of Finance is a revenue-generating department. We collect annually about $2.5 billion in revenue, most of which is general fund revenue. So any impacts to our operations will definitely have an impact on our ability to meet the revenue-generating targets. The 33 positions equates to about $8.8 million in annual revenue loss. Should the positions be deleted from our department, we have identified a way to mitigate our salary gap by instituting a credit card convenience fee. Presently, when a taxpayer pays by credit card, the bank charges a fee to the city, which is not recovered. And for the prior fiscal year, the total cost that was not recovered was about $2.1 million. What we are proposing is that the fee be implemented. It ranges from 0.07% to 2.15%. And if it is implemented, we do not believe that all of the taxpayers who have used credit cards previously will utilize it once the fee is implemented, because the fee will be optional. The taxpayer will continue to have other options to pay its tax debt. They can pay by check, credit card, or ACH. And so basically this convenience fee will just recover the fee should a taxpayer continue to pay by credit card. Either way, it needs to be addressed so that it can be mitigated in terms of the impacts to the city overall. There is an existing ordinance that is out there that allows city departments to recover the cost. And so we are asking that we be granted the opportunity to go forward with that. What we will need is the three application support programmers that were eliminated from ITA's budget to be restored in order to implement this, as well as other LA tax efficiencies that we have identified. Case in point, we would like for taxpayers to be able to register online. They currently cannot do that. And we do need to have the application programs on board. 
The other thing I want to point out is if we are able to implement the convenience fee, it would reduce our $1.5 million salary gap to about $450,000. And what we have also identified through the ERIP is that about 25 positions, possibly more depending on who is excluded or included in the ERIP, will be retiring from our operations. And given that we are a revenue-generating department, we would ask that those positions be backfilled to minimize the impact on the city's revenue base. The other thing that I definitely want to touch on is that we are having some impacts with the managed hiring process. We recognize that, you know, the city is in dire needs in terms of mitigating the fiscal deficit. But given that our positions generate far more than what is – what their costs are, it would definitely have a further impact on the city's general fund. Also, I want to state is that 67 percent of our positions are represented by EAA. So they are on furlough, and most of those would be eliminated if we are not able to address our salary gap. And with that, I'll just open it up to questions. Mr. Parks, also I wanted to point out that on item – agenda item three of the agenda, finance does have a letter regarding the proposed use of $500,000 in discretionary funds. And just one question, Antoinette, is that included in the $1.5 million deficit? You've already accounted – Right. We factored the $500,000 in the net. So the $1.5 million is what we believe to be the case presently, including that amount. Okay. And that would save about seven revenue-generating positions. Thank you. Let me just ask, on the credit card issue you mentioned, what's the status of that proposal? Is that an ordinance that's required? No. An ordinance – we currently have authority to move forward with that. I think an ordinance was approved by the mayor and council back in, I think, 2005. That's for the credit card charges? For the credit card convenience fee recovery. Okay. The issue is that the staff, the ITA staff who support the L.A. tax system, three of them were eliminated during the budget exercise and, therefore, are no longer supporting the L.A. tax system. These positions are needed in order to implement the convenience fee. So they've got to upgrade the L.A. tax system? Yes. Is that something you can't do internally? No. We do not have the staff to support that. And ITA has indicated that, you know, they will try to work to address it, but because, you know, the three staff have been eliminated, it would be difficult to have in place by the – we need to have it in place no later than October of this fiscal year in order to have it available for the tax renewal season, which goes into effect January 1st of 2010. And they're saying you need all three people to do this upgrade, or are there other upgrades? No, there are other efficiency improvements that I indicated in the white paper addressing the convenience fee. Case in point, the – we want to make improvements to the L.A. tax system to allow businesses to register online. We also want to make available other alternative methods of payments, payments over the Internet, e-check payments. All of that requires programming. We are also transitioning our print – printing of our notices to the general services department. And to fully transition to GSD will require some L.A. tax programming that we would need the programmers to implement. And there are many other L.A. tax efficiencies that we have noted that would be put into place, provided that we are able to restore the positions and move forward with them. So would the funding for that come out of your – the tax increase, or how has that worked in the past as far as the ITA doing the work for you? It would mitigate the credit card convenience fee, which is – How did you pay them? Did they – is that just resources on their staff, or did you have to fund those positions out of your budget? How did ITA – Oh, I'm sorry. No, they were – they were currently – well, previously, rather, within ITA's department. They were staff housed by ITA, but they supported the L.A. tax system. 
the staff are, have been deleted, the positions, so they're no longer in ITA's budget. Uh, Mr. Luther, can we look at that in the sense of uh, those positions or whether there's a need, is that something that could be done uh, by a vendor or something if we're talking about these upgrades that uh, appear there's a shelf life on getting them done is it, rather than hiring people, is there another means of getting the, the resources done if these improvements will bring revenue into the city? then we need to figure out how best to address it. I think uh, can we had taken a preliminary look at the proposal, and of course we support um, getting additional revenue. And, and uh, we, uh, I think because of the time constraints that Antoinette has uh, to implement the changes, we, we will try to report back by Monday the 10th okay. um, with, I think we'll have to sit down with Antoinette and kind of go over the staffing requirements a bit, try to see if we can prior prioritize whatever the work is to be done, and if there's any other uh, uh, things we should look at as far as maybe getting her some staff support. And one idea that our office had, had at least uh, wanted to consider was if ITA could loan those employees rather than hire new employees, if that would if that would work if ITA had the resources to do that. We're, cer we're certainly in support of just moving this forward, so we will definitely work with the CAO's office and request that ITA be present during the discussions. Yes. Is that, are, are the skills you're looking for, for all of those improvements, the same level of skill, or the same group of employees can do everything? Is that? Uh, the application programmers that were assigned to, to the LA tax system um, actually learned the code behind the LA tax system, so they know the programming language uh, that is, uh, is required to make changes to the LA tax system itself. So it would be good if we could, I, I understand, I think those positions have been eliminated, but the staff have been uh, redirected to other uh, ITA projects. So what we're asking or hoping is that we will be able to get those specific staff back to uh, make the necessary changes to the LA tax system so that we can move forward with these efficiency improvements as well as the credit card convenience fee. Right. Let, let me ask, uh, do, uh, I think we need to maybe an update at some point in budget and finance. Your amnesty program just concluded mm -hmm. and then I forget the number of people we put into the system for your greater um, ability to audit. I forget how many, how many positions that we uh, put in your budget? Uh, the amnesty program, I think that... Was, Joy, those were all loans, I believe. Right. How many? Oh, help. We had a couple separate components. We had a council motion where we were provided some tax auditors on loan who were former employees, and that was four tax auditors, three. or three that came on board, three or four actually came on board, and we're putting together a report on the performance that they achieved, and we're hoping to have that report for you probably in late October. Um, and that's tax, on the amnesty? No, the, there, were, there were several things. Okay. On the tax amnesty program, we were able to borrow staff, former staff from other departments. I believe that was about eight staff. And they were working to handle the day-to-day -day operations of manning our telephones for the tax amnesty program. They're still on board, and under the charter section, they still have, I believe it's about another one or two weeks to go and then they'll return to their department. And preliminarily, what did we come out on? Um, let me just also say um, it's not just the seven or eight staff that were uh, transferred to Office of Finance that supported the amnesty program. It really was, uh, certainly took the effort of all of the Office of Finance staff, particularly in the last two weeks of the amnesty program. Mm -hmm. uh, to date, we have collected $10.1 million. The goal was $10 million. We have about 1.7 million in installment agreements, uh, which is which are 12-month uh, installment agreements, uh, because the amnesty program ended July 31st, and uh, which was last Friday, and the fact that the amnesty payment, if it was postmarked by July 31st, uh, as well as the penalty waiver application, we will also include any uh, payments that have come in. Uh, since July 31st, and so we expect to have additional payments coming in over the next two weeks. Uh, the 
overall goal is to have all of the reconciliation completed by the end of August. But just looking at the 10.1 million and the 1.7 million that are in installment agreements, you're looking at about 12 million dollars. So, uh, so the installments are not inclusive of the 10 million. It's in addition to. In addition to. So they roughly uh, $12 million for amnesty, and that's, that was primarily loaned to personnel. No, no, no. <laughs> it, I mean, it, 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 it took the whole department. No, no, right. I understand that, but I'm saying in order to create that operation, we had to loan people in to your department. We didn't give you new bodies on the budget. We loaned people in to work within your operation. Right, that is correct. Uh, about eight or nine uh, individuals were transferred on a temporary basis, but you had calls coming into our call center. You had our field enforcement staff out there working with the taxpayers to get them to comply. Um, we had the audit staff uh, working on the amnesty program, as well as all of our other uh, units within the office. When we expanded the audit, audit function, there were, those were the bodies we added to your department. I thought we were there were also, yes, uh, 10 new tax auditors and two senior tax auditors uh, were added to increase the audit penetration rate. Uh, as of today, um, we have, I think, about four position audit positions that we need to fill uh, that have yet to be filled. We have comp conducted interviews, but what we have found is that a number of the auditors, uh, the potential uh, candidates who, uh, who interviewed, uh, chose not to accept the offer because of the pending furloughs and potential layoffs with the city. So what, did, what was the number? Was it 12 total? 12 total, yes. And then how many have we filled since then? We've filled all but uh, four positions, four tax yeah, audit positions. All but four. Right, yes. So we have eight. So have we seen any results of the pen, deeper penetration? Many of them started uh, near the end of June. Uh, and they have to go through a training program. We anticipate to see results from, from these tax auditors this fiscal year. Okay, so towards the end of the fiscal year, you begin to see some results. They, many of them were hired this uh, no, I mean, at the end of this fiscal year. Oh, yes, June absolutely. 30th, absolutely. 2010, yes. Will yes. be the first results we'll see. Yes. Right now, let me ask you on the issue of the recent changes that we made in the uh, moving debt to outside vendors to collect up to 5000 and also being able to waive the $5,000, the $1,000 to $5,000 criteria for internal issues. My understanding is that we relieve some people in your department from those functions to transfer to other functions. Uh, I, I think uh, my staff will be reporting back on that, and I don't believe council, full council has heard that item. Um, but what will actually happen is that our collection investigators will have a more manageable workload uh, to, uh, to work on. Presently, their, their workloads are much higher than industry standards for collection uh, investigators or agents. And there's different classification than the auditors? Yes, they are. They're different. So they, they basically remain where they are and they just assume a, sm a smaller workload because we're jettisoning some of this to other people. Right. They would have a more manageable workload and it would be in comparison to industry standards for other collection mm -hmm. uh, agents. Would that prompt a higher return? Um, we certainly anticipate that. Uh, for the prior fiscal year, our collection uh, investigators on average collected about $1.1 million each. So wouldn't we be prepared to bring something to tell us about what impact on personnel those two changes made? Um, well, the collection investigators are on the furlough. They're part of EAA, and um, so and they are also part of the group that could potentially be laid off. Uh, we're hopeful that we will be able to, you know, keep our positions. And uh, if that is the case, and once council approves the increase in the threshold, we can certainly come back uh, within six to 12 months to provide an update. If you want us to provide an update sooner, we can do that too. Right, so we have that coming as an update. We then have an update on the uh, um, issue of the, um, what is it, the amnesty. 
for that that's forthcoming? Yes. The, uh, as part of the ordinance, when uh, the mayor and council approved the amnesty, uh, you all directed our office to come back with a report back. And as I indicated, uh, it's going to take us about three weeks or so to um, take, in, take into consideration any payments that may have come in since the July 31st uh, postmark, postmark date. Uh, also, we need to just reconcile the, the, the information and the numbers. So our plan is to have a report back to council sometime uh, during the month of September okay, on the amnesty program. And then also in June next year is when we get the report back on the deeper penetration uh, for this yeah. fiscal year. Yes, we, we believe a full year would be best before a report back is submitted. Again, briefly, why the anticipated $1.4 million deficit? Where is that coming from? Well, the bulk of our deficit um, is due to our portion of shared sacrifice and responsibility in this share of uncertain revenues. The hit on our budget from those two items was $3.6 million. And our gap has been closing due to the furlough, and we've already had some employees retire. Okay, and before you go on, but the shared sacrifice, when we started the coming, this fiscal year, we got a sense of how much that would be. Was it larger than you expected? That should have been accounted for. Well, it left a gap in our budget. It still uh, left sir. a gap. Yes. We didn't leave, we didn't leave you whole. Absolutely, yes. Oh, okay. We did our analysis based on our current level of payroll to come up with the gap, and then we redid that again for the revised operational plan. Right. All, all departments took a 10 percent. Yeah, cut. but but uh, okay. But I, I thought a majority of that would come from perhaps the the furlough, the furloughs, and the ERIPs and adjusting for that. Um, but to well, and not all of our staff is represented by EAA. 67% right. of our staff are. The remaining uh, staff are not on furlough. Okay. And what's the breakdown in terms of the percentage, if you could, of the 1.4 million as to where those impacts are coming from or the dollar amounts if you have those? I'm, I'm not sure I follow you. Do you have a breakdown of where, uh, how you came up with the 1.4? And did you provide that in your memo to us? I, I, Everything is very detailed I didn't see that in, here. in in our analysis that was attached to the operational plan. Okay. We had uh, uh, assumptions. It's on the CAO worksheet where we determine our salary requirements for existing staff. Okay. We looked at our salaries, in, including the permanent <coughs> bonuses, based on the current level of payroll, mm -hmm. the annual sick leave payout, how much we had expended to date which was really for the first several days of the fiscal year because of the way the, the payroll periods end. We backed out for actual retirements. Uh, we also backed out one termination, and we planned for new hires of the four tax auditors that we spoke about that will be filling for the audit penetration rate, and also for some pending requests that we have at the Managed Hiring Committee. Um, when we take all of this into consideration, we came up with our salary requirement for this current year and compared that with our appropriation to come up with the, the shortfall of the 1.5. I see. Okay. Thank you. Have you uh, been given the task by the mayor's office to look at those recommendations he made about the um, uh, business tax and uh, business tax recovery? It's about four different ideas. Is that go to you for evaluation? Yes, uh, our office will definitely be working on those. Um, and also, I believe the CAO and CLA were directed by some of the council uh, members to come back with a number of business tax reform measures. I know that the uh, Council Member Smith's committee is meeting tomorrow, and we will be present to um, committee? Uh, jobs, growth, uh, and business tax They'll be meeting retention. tomorrow to discuss that item? to discuss a number of uh, report backs uh, by the Office of Finance, CAO, and CLA. Uh, relative to the mayor's letter uh, relating to the Board of Review in terms of overruling a prior decision, uh, my office is presently working on a report back uh, that will go to the City Council for consideration. Uh, we are hopeful to have that report ready for Council's consideration when you return from your uh, recess, if not sooner. 
Um, and so we are working on, on that. Uh, in addition to a number of other items that the mayor has directed our office to uh, complete. Okay. And then uh, through the uh, uh, claims board, we'd ask that your department look at a reevaluation of our reimbursement uh, policy and the interest paid on those reimbursements. How far we away on those two? The penalty waiver report, I actually have uh, a draft copy of that. Staff had provided that to me. Um, I expect to have uh, my comments included and release early part of next week. Um, we've been, you know, I've been working, I'm short staff, so I've been working on a number of items. Uh, the penalty waiver piece uh, was sort of back burner because of the amnesty program, um, but I do anticipate having that report ready for the claims board uh, early next week. As is far that, as the Does that include the interest issue or is the interest issue separate? That will be a separate report and staff are presently working on that. Okay. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, for, um, I have a question for the CAO and CAO by uh, either, if the shared for sacrifice when we adopted our budget, didn't we cut service or cut positions so that we made up for that? So anything we see through this process, we shouldn't see anything in the shared sacrifice, correct? Uh, the, the, the shared sacrifice did not designate any specific uh, positions. It was just a, a reduction from the salaries general accounts. So. In this particular circumstance, uh, for finance, every employee that is not an EA employee that is not currently on furlough is generating a deficit. Um, in addition, I, as I recall, finance is fairly fully staffed. They have a 4.5% salary savings rate, so that would be another explanation of just a deficit that's going to be there uh, regardless of anything that would have happened. That is a very, very valid point. I forgot to talk about the salary savings factor. That's about 17 positions that we have to uh, maintain vacant in order to satisfy the salary savings rate. Right. And those are revenue generating positions. So right. even if we said you're going to get 10% cut across your budget and we adopted a budget for 0910 saying, okay, we see we're going to cut to get to this 10%, we're still seeing remnants of that? Yes, I mean, there, there would be. Uh, Lynn is at the table, too, so I'm sure she has a comment. But uh, I think what we're seeing as we review the operational plans that there are deficits in some of these departments, uh, regardless of they're, make, they're making assumptions that employees are taking uh, furloughs in EAA and that there will be an ERIP, and there still are some deficits in departments. But, but some of that's caused by people who have been given their cost of living that are EAA and uh, and then I think the issue of the um, layoffs did not occur, and so uh, I think some of that just created. I think as uh, uh, ethics talked about earlier, if you do not have a workforce that turns over, and you have a three four percent uh, uh, yes. salary saving, mm -hmm. uh, that's also a deficit. Salary savings play a part, and then Antoinette and Joy had mentioned the removal of uncertain revenues. That was an additional 4% cut, yeah. and some departments are using uh, some of their discretionary funds to offset that, but m most departments did not get a, a discretionary fund, so they have to absorb that amount as well. Yeah, well, well, this one was bigger than a lot of other departments as well, so it kind of stood out. And, and I'd like to add that we also have several <coughs> positions in our department that are really layoff avoidance positions where they're not funded at all in our budget, but the positions are carried and we still have to pay the cost of those positions. Mm -hmm. Yes, I wanted to, Joy mentioned the um, substitute authorities that they are carrying that aren't funded for layoff avoidance and for other purposes. Um, so that it also is contributing toward their um, shortfall. Yeah, okay. So, you know, this department was treated like any other department in the city. I recognize that, um, you know, they are revenue generating, but because they were treated like every other department, including all the electeds, this is the situation that we're in. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we'd be happy to report back um, at a later date regarding this department, but that's part of the difficulty that the managed hiring committee is facing right now. Yeah. yeah. Well, good. Well, it helps us uh, rectify this and secondly plan for the following fiscal year as to how we, mm -hmm. the decisions we make and uh, the aftermath that, uh, unanticipated aftermath we may get from that. Thank you.
And, you know, I just want to say, finally, uh, you know, we certainly understand the, the situation that the city is under. We are just hopeful that you will allow our office to uh, maintain our position so that we could continue to generate the general fund revenue uh, that the city sorely needs and not impact the current revenue base uh, now and on a go-forward basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the next department is housing. Good afternoon, Rushmore Cervantes, along with Marlene Garza from the Los Angeles Housing Department. Uh, if everything stays as if, as is right now through the end of the fiscal year, the department would realize $6.6 .6 million in fee-for-service and grant savings. Uh, that consists of 10% vacancy rate, as well as the 40% of the department staff that are subject to the mandatory furlough, as well as the long process it takes to get positions filled through the managed hiring process. Uh, this department is sustaining the same operational uh, issues that any of the other departments are having with these reductions in accounting and in systems not having a proper staffing as well as in the uh, rent stabilization inspections. Uh, the investigators, uh, because of the furloughs, are, are not able to address the, uh, the issues as quickly as they have in the past, as well as our billing and collections. Obviously, as things are delayed uh, proportionally to the uh, number of furlough days that are off. Um, we anticipate probably about a 5% uh, take on the ERIF if it does go forward, so that will obviously uh, compound the department's issues. Uh, things that come to mind here offhand for uh, the uh, committee and the council and the city as a whole is that with the block grant dollars that the department receives, there's uh, certain obligations uh, that are tied to those monies as well as uh, obligations to future ARA grants that we have uh, been awarded and have applied for, where we need to be able to sustain ongoing grant-funded programs now in order to be able to provide services for our grants in the future, as well as you have fee for services uh, that we're entitled, we're supposed to provide services for the fees that are, are charged to the constituents. Uh, as an example, the $6.6 .6 million that I've referenced is uh, savings. Uh, approximately $4.3 million of that is for uh, rent and code by itself. Uh, another viewpoint would be for the city as a whole looking at uh, the issue of trying to relieve the reserve fund and the general fund, uh, looking at the positions that we have vacant, approximately 60 positions that are vacant, 26 of those are uh, positions that are shared amongst the city. I'm talking about systems, staff, management analysts, clerk typists, things of that nature. And looking at those positions, just the ones that are sh shared amongst uh, the city, uh, if uh, the, they are grant funded, special funded, that if they were filled by general funded positions from uh, other departments, that would relieve the general fund upwards of $2.3 million. That's both uh, salaries as well as indirect costs. So I just present that to you as far as our operational issues uh, and uh, we're looking for means by which that we be, could be able to assist uh, the city uh, by uh, relieving uh, it of some general fund burden from its staff as well as uh, able to achieve uh, its mission relative to the fees that are charged to the constituents and the grant monies that are provided to the department. Let me just ask, on your special funds, they, they're dedicated only to specific tasks? That's correct. Do they roll over year to year? Uh, yes, they do. And the concern would be, as an example, for uh, if you look at the code inspection program, the uh, it's charged for a specific service. If it continues to roll over, at some point, if there is an abundance of monies that are keep rolling over, then it would be perceived as an, uh, that the city is overbilling the constituents. So yes, it does roll over, but there is a danger that in the future the city could be uh, liable to repay constituents that money back if we're not spending the money. Okay. You know, and the, the CEO's heard this before over and over. Uh, but the issue, I think this is one of those that clearly identifies that the uh, overall uh, cookie cutter approach we've taken doesn't fit. Uh, on the one hand, in general service department, we're cutting services significantly from tree trimming to street sidewalks and alleys and everything else. But here we have seven, six, seven million dollars. The special fund can't be used for anything else. And we're creating an artificial savings by saying don't go to the, do the work. And we also could lay off people or furlough them when we could actually get the work done. 
And so this is something that we just need to keep revisiting and understand the concern about people having a, a unique or different work environment. But I think we've done that in the past with grants versus non-grants. And I think today, depending on if you're EAA or the coalition, you're sitting right across the table from each other with totally different ways in which the city is dealing with your particular status. So this is, a, a, I think, a key indication that we're taking somewhere around $7 million worth of services from the community just to, quote, put it under the label of being fair, when in fact the fairness issue for community is being overlooked. So we'd ask for you to look at uh, that. Mr. Coltis is here in the audience. I'm sure he heard that. Okay. Okay. We'll move that item. Thank you very much. Uh, the last three departments uh, are Human Services, Department of Neighborhood Empowerment, and Personnel. Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Cheryl Serrano, Kelly Hawkins, Human Services Department. Um, we're in the middle of a um, short-term uh, operational transition. Uh, we emailed you that plan last month. Um, to determine, uh, first of all, to implement unified systems and reporting structures throughout the department uh, to enable us to be more transparent and efficient, and secondly, to find initial short-term synergies between staff. Um, so we did not submit uh, an operational plan per se because we're in the middle of um, determining that, uh, how we're going to operate the department with its 24 employees currently and um, also congruently uh, the 33 board members, the advisory board members that we have. Um, we are projecting a balanced budget at the end of the year, primarily due to a 30 percent vacancy rate and uh, furloughs for uh, two-thirds of our employees. Um, the department so far, uh, the combined three departments, have accumulated a total of $930,000 of grants and in-kind services um, for the next two fiscal years. Uh, we have one likely retirement. It's an accounting clerk, and we're working to, um, on a session plan to train a, a staff member to assume those duties. Uh, we are really, really, really trying to do more with less. Uh, we do have some initial issues in that um, we have one grant. It's a YWAR grant. Uh, last year, we had to give back. A third of the grant, uh, it's not a big grant, $230,000. Um, we had to give back $78,000 because we were not able to fill vacancies. Uh, so we will be coming back to the managing process to try to fill that with as needed positions because it's a badly needed service and it's just a pity that we have to return that money. Um, other than that, um, if you have any questions. Uh, Let me just ask, uh, you did not have the ability to do a operational plan, but I think during the budget we'd ask for a transition plan to give. Oh, we did that. We disseminated done. that. Uh, we have a short-term operational plan for the first 60 days of the department's operations and very specific goals. Uh, we just, I'm sorry, we weren't able to submit an updated org chart because we don't know what that will be yet. Where, did that, where did that plan go? Is that in... Uh, we submitted it uh, via the CLA's office to both budget and finance. Um, we understand uh, it, it was uh, it, Arts and Parks. Arts and Parks. Park. And uh, I think it went before council as well. And the initial one went here. And additionally, we have uh, sent it to all the council members. So we're in the process of meeting with um, their representatives to go over any of their concerns. Uh, about regarding that plan, but it's a very basic nuts and bolts operational plan to get the department ready, um, you know, to make A, make the department efficient and operate well, and B, to get the department ready for long-term strategic planning, which the three advisory boards will conduct with the new G general manager. Okay. Let me ask, Mr. Lewis, do we have any idea where the ordinance is that creates a department? Uh, we, uh, I think, I believe the mayor's office and the city attorney are the lead on that, so I think they're in the process of submitting that relatively soon. Yes. I mean, the city attorney has it, or has it been? The city attorney still has it. There's no substantive change in the ordinance as regard to content. It's basically a cut and paste of the three uh, 
prior department's ordin ordinances, uh, and uh, that will be revisited within a year um, after a comprehensive strategic planning process is, is undertaken. We'd like to see if we can't get that ordinance because until it is, it's an ordinance, we don't have a department, yet we're setting salary schedules and everything else, and we're doing transition plans. So we do need the ordinance as quickly as we can get it. And then I think we have a phase two at some point once this is operational. So the quicker we can get the ordinance, the better. Okay. okay. Any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, neighborhood Empowerment. Council members, next to last, if I'm like Kim, General Manager, Neighborhood Empowerment, I will just briefly summarize the highlights of our uh, response to the request for a modified operations plan. The majority of our staff are EAA, um, so we've instituted work furloughs. We um, don't anticipate anybody, uh, any of the staff taking advantage of the uh, early retirement option. And uh, we project a $127,000 deficit by the end of the fiscal year, which we would make up if required to by eliminating bilingual bonuses of uh, our field staff and uh, two additional staff positions. Um, lastly, we uh, have been trying to refill a, a vacancy that was uh, left when one of our senior MA1s left for another department to oversee the revision, revising and re-engineering of our funding program. Uh, Council Member Parks, as you recall, the Budget and Finance Committee had looked at the uh, issue of checks and balances, transparency and proper reconciliation of those funds and it is very important that we have capable management staff that can oversee a lot of the overhauling of the problems that we've experienced in the past. So that is my one request. The uh, city controller is currently conducting an audit of the NC funding program. So once the results uh, are in of that audit, we uh, will look at what's necessary in terms of revamping that program. Okay. And it shows you that you had proposed possibly uh, reducing or eliminating the bilingual premium. Is that something that's in an MOU or is that something that is uh, within the discretion of the department? It's within the discretion of the department. They are, it will leave a tremendous gap in terms of being able to serve the needs of limited English populations. That's obviously a big concern of the cities. Um, is that what the equipment you use for the meetings? No, we have a separate uh, contracts with vendors that provide translation services. These are more um, translation needs that occur uh, as, as in the course of the daily work that we do. Most of that is uh, Spanish bilingual services. Okay. Is the primary issue within Dunn the area of managing the uh, annual stipend and ensuring that it's being uh, administered uh, Accurately, is that the number one mission? Well, there are probably two priority issues. One is continuing to provide ongoing technical assistance and training for the neighborhood council board members who are volunteers. The city clerk is administering elections for all 89 neighborhood councils next spring. So it'll be very important for us to have the kind of training in place so that we um, if sure as many board members are playing with the same understandings of the rules and procedures. And then secondly would be the funding program in terms of making sure that the checks and balances are there, that the programs are being used to the most effective purposes as possible. And you were going through what your first cycle of elections? Excuse me? You're going through your first cycle of elections no, that the city clerk is dealing with? No, the city clerk will begin their elections in the spring starting from March of next year okay. and conducting them over the next four or five so months. So they're what, going through preparation for that? Okay. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, last but certainly not least is the personnel department. Let's have a drum roll. <laughs> I think you could work the zoo and you'd have been gone. <laughs> Ask them what you deserve to do and be at the end. I don't know what to uh, get to parks. But. <laughs> well, good afternoon. Um, actually, we have a, uh, an organization chart for your 
review. I'll just give you an overview. The current budget for the personnel department is $61 million. The budget was reduced by $9.4 million. $8.3 million is from our salary account, which is the equivalent of 108 positions. $1 million is from our contractual services account, and $100,000 is from our office and administration account. This includes reductions of $3.6 million for shared sacrifice and $1.3 million for uncertain revenues. Our salary savings rate continues at 5% in the amount of $1.7 million, the equivalent of 25 positions, and our vacancy rate is currently at 6%. Our current projected deficit is $2.7 million. We have approximately 110 employees in the personnel department qualified for early retirement. If 47 people take early retirement, and this would be by October the 1st, we should be able to cover our $2.7 million deficit. Included in that deficit is work furlough that we have for our employees. Our EAA employees are not quite 50% of the personnel department, and the work furlough amount that we would be able to save is $1.3 million. That said, our labor force, our current labor force, is 19% below budgeted strength. If 47 employees take the IRIP or are laid off, we'll be down by 28%. This will render us unable to perform a number of services, which will have to be determined. At the present time, we're looking at consolidating divisions, scaling back on services such as training, and extending service response times. We're looking at a new model for the personnel department, but many of our duties are dictated by city charter and state and federal law. I have to remind you that whether we downsize by IRIP or layoff, the city will still be left with significant organizational and classification issues that will have to be addressed. There's also a significant burden on our employee benefits division in the event of layoffs. We continue to proceed with reviewing employee work histories and are proceeding with developing layoff lists. Nine percent of the personnel department is devoted, is dedicated to this effort. If you look at the organization chart that's before you, what I tried to do was to lay out division by division the number of employees that are authorized, the number of vacant positions we have, the number of employees who would be eligible for early retirement, as well as the number of people who have been removed from those assignments to be a part of the layoff team. So you can see by looking at this, we're running very thin. I doubt that there's any department that has a greater appreciation for what the city is faced with. So we do know that this is not business as usual. We are willing to do our part. It's just that I think this committee, as well as the council, does need to be aware that in order for us to continue to do what it looks like we are going to have to continue doing. I don't think that we can take too many more cuts. Let me ask, on your organization chart in red, are those positions you've moved within your department, or are those new allocated positions, or where do they come from? Those are existing positions within the department. Right. And you told us you've reviewed how many personnel packages? We're probably close to 14,000. 14,000. So that's in the likelihood if there is no ERIP and we go into layoffs, you are pretty well down the road as to addressing layoffs in the city. We're down the road, but again, we're down the road without a map. The other issue, if you have 14,000, do you have any idea what that will equate to as actual layoffs? No, I don't. And, you know, as I say, we are down the road without a map. We still don't know. You know, we have the 74 positions that were identified earlier in the budget. Then there were another 74 positions. We've worked the EAA positions, and we've also worked the coalition positions. We now are going to continue to work with whatever information we've got, because we think that we're burning daylight. Time is of the essence. I know that just within my own budget, we're now on August the 3rd, and we still have the same number of employees on our payroll, and there's no way that we can sustain that throughout the year 
without some relief. So um, I, I am just as confused, I think, as everybody else in the city is. And uh, yeah, we hope in a couple of weeks, uh, yes. yeah, in a couple of weeks that we'll have a game plan. Okay. But let me just, you know, one of the things that I think is critical for your department that not only you know people are contemplating ERIP, e but also the fact is looking at an option that they ERIPs may not be viable, and then if that's so and those employees receive their return of their cost of living, and then you are into a furlough layoff plan, then not only how does it affect your operation, but how does it affect you serving the rest of the city who's pushing all that paperwork into your department? So I think those are the kind of options, I think, uh, over the next week or so that they're going to have to come to grips with because uh, uh, it's getting way, real late to be having all of these options. At some point, they're going to have to solidify, and we're going to have to have a course to, uh, going forward because we're into the second month of the first quarter. And so uh, uh, it's got to be something done pretty quickly. There, there is an instruction, uh, a prior instruction from the committee for the Seattle report back on, on that issue. And I think the game plan would be, as, as you said, once we determine essentially what the game plan is, we can look at uh, the work that's going to be required from the personnel department, look at the staffing, and then address those issues. Yeah, because they can't survive with a $3 million deficit, and they certainly can't survive with additional cuts. Right. Yeah. Let, me, let me just give some direction on, thank you very much. Uh, let me just give some, some direction. You're going to give no, me no, direction? No, no, no. no, no. These, these, these are low level. We would only give you high power direction. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> let, let me ask if we could, uh, and I think the game plan is that on the two uh, meetings we've had with all the departments, we have no expectation the city clerk is going to do any report for us, but we did this for the benefit of CAO and CLA to come to grips with what the, t the most up-to-date information on the overages and deficits. Uh, what we need is, and I'm guessing September 14th, if we can live with that date, that we have a plan. If the, res if the issue of ERIPs are not resolved, we'll need a plan for both scenarios as to the direction that is best proposed for the city to get through not only the $360 million deficit, but what we may be impacted by the state and other issues within our, our environment. And so uh, with that, uh, we'll need that comprehensive report, and that would be above and beyond any um, report that deals with our FSR. This is really just setting in place a game plan for each department. If there is no ERIP, then this is the number of people they must begin to either furlough, whether there's a recommendation we increase the number of furloughs. All of those options need to be brought so that we get to council, we can have the, uh, the game plan, plus attached to that should be the operational plans so departments will tell us if these things come to pass, this is how they're going to look, and that's across the board for every department. Right now, the only department that's moving forward is the fire department is August 6th. Mm -hmm. They have put a plan in place, but that's two-thirds of their deficit. And so as we move forward, we're going to have to accommodate uh, how we're going to address that. And again, as we did in the budget, uh, we're going to only be able to deal with what we know because I think we've expended since December a great deal of energy on what could happen, and we've only seen a little bit of that come to life. And so we're going to have to at least bring to the council recommendations to say we're at a, almost at a point of no return. Uh, we can't turn this ship in six months or four months. It's got to be done in this quarter or starting this quarter, first quarter of this fiscal year. We're going to start making major adjustments to the budget. And so if we can look at that for September the 14th and, and hopefully be in council before the end of September, which we lose one quarter, that we will uh, set up thing in, something in place that from October to the end of the fiscal year, how we're going to address uh, what nine months, okay. yeah, nine months uh, program. So if we can move forward on that, and then once that report is in committee, then once if we make alterations in committee on the 14th, 
then we uh, have a, a city clerk report that goes with it. But all that material that we've covered in the last two meetings basically was done for the benefit of CAOCLA to create the game plan for us. And so we have no other. What's that now? Did I do it? Yes, I, I am. Yeah, we are done with item oh, three. Oh, number three. Also, we want to include oh. that in your game plan report. All right. So that we don't the, just the letters. Sit, yeah, the letters. So you could say how they're using them. That compensates for the losses and deficits. So we don't have it go separately. Okay. It's all inclusive in the report. Okay. Okay. So Mr. Parks, on item three, would you like to just hold those? Keep those as. We'll, continued, or would you like the to thing is, is that that will go into the game plan report mm -hmm. that we're w waiting for on September the 14th. So, so the council file itself will just it will just hold it here, okay. and it will. But when he responds to that report, that material right. will move oh, forward as one report. Okay. okay. We have no other uh, comments, and so we'll adjourn the meeting.